Good morning, folks. You're very welcome. Uh, for those who don't know me, I think most people will. I'm John Hannan. I'm Director of Student Services. And as I walked over here this morning, I thought of somebody most of you, I'd say, will know. Hubert McDermott, who was here, and he used to say, awareness is 90%. And we had a few coffees where we disagreed in relation to that, because I think it's really important to be aware, but it's more important to be able to know what to do. And this morning is very much about being aware um, it's, it's the old, nearly cliche at this stage, Nunaska Karlehele, strength lies in working together. And we all know that it's really, really important that we do work, cooperate and so forth, and be informed. And that's the nature of what we actually want to do. And I want to thank Gronje for organising it, and obviously yourselves for, for coming here this morning, because all of us have one thing in common. We are certain that we want student success. That's core to our mission that we want students to progress to do well. And it's quite challenging for them, and we have to remember the, the, the different cohorts that we have and the changes that we're very much aware of. And I see a number of people here who are directly involved, for example, in working, and all of us are in different ways, with non-traditional students. So we're talking about students from lower socioeconomic groups, students with a disability, and so on and so forth. And that, at the moment, is nearly one quarter of our population. We also know the massive growth in international students, and that's coming to a point where by 2020 it will be 25%. So in effect, in broad brush strokes, half of our population are not our kind of traditional cohort. And we all know the growth um, that has happened in higher education and in certain areas there's more growth in Inuit Gaul in recent times in the post-grad taught end, but there's growth overall. There isn't an intention to grow massively at the undergraduate level, but we constantly, when we meet, we say about the complexity. How complex it is the challenges that we have in terms of working with students and the complexities they, they present. And of course, fundamentally, they're the same as they ever were, they're wonderful people, but all of us hit bumps in the road. And I love to say the strength of people is when, they work, when we work with each other and we get support. Weakness is when we're on our own. And very often, when we do get anxious and when stuff happens is when it's does become challenging, one of the first things that happens is that the kind of the brain kicks out. We don't necessarily think logically. And us, I suppose, sitting here today and we have the cup of coffee and so forth, if it hits us at the back of our mind when we meet a student, yes, there is that service. We don't have to have it ourselves, but it's really, really important to know who does what because it's very, very complex for the students, particularly when stuff hits the fan as to know where to go. But we're not all about, in case of emergency, break glass, when it goes wrong. It's about their developmental opportunities. And we have 100 and, what is it, 26, I think, societies at the moment, 46 clubs and so forth. There are wonderful opportunities for people to get together and to engage. And yet, in the midst of all of that, we know from our own research that's quite robust using international measures that one in every four of our undergraduate students has severe or very severe anxiety. So that anxiety does create quite a challenge for us. And information is power, and I suppose by knowing each other and by knowing the information, that's a help. That awareness is the 90%, but I suppose that, that extra 10% on what to do is, is a challenge. And the session this morning is very much about that, about learning from each other, knowing the person that you can make the call to, and helping each other often it's the cup of coffee before you come in, the person that you talk to, and the person afterwards is the most valuable stuff too. So I'm really thankful to Gronje and to everybody for coming here to actually share that. And I also want to focus a little bit on a particular area because it's under student services and the, the people involved are, are really, really busy at the moment in accommodation and welfare. So I said I would step into the breach for, for the moment because our deadline is... The, in that area is the 7th of December, which is Friday, where payments have to go out. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the financial end of things, because at the end of the day, money is really important. Dave will talk in a little while as well um, about the, the nature of the financial counselling aspect of it. But I just want to give you broad brushstrokes firstly around the accommodation and then um, also in relation to the financial aid. So we have a financial aid fund here, if you weren't aware of it, and obviously the rationale is to give people money. The challenge is to give the right people the right amounts of money. And we are constantly looking at that. We have had 
the biggest amount of applications of any other higher education institution, bar none, over the last number of years. So this year, for example, it, in semester one, we had 1,700 applications. That's a lot of people looking for money. And they apply online, and in terms of a process, there's a scoring system, there's a group that looks at that, a working group that looks at that, an advisory group, and they are from the colleges and from some of the relevant units and so forth as well. A decision is made on that scoring system, and then they're scored, and they have to send in documentation. So it's, it's a long process, and we're looking at it, and it's evolving. And in that first semester, I would say about 700 of the 1,700 original applications will actually get money. There is also a hardship fund, um, which is very small for very immediate things. And I let the chaplaincy discuss that if they want to or not, but just to be aware of it, it's very small, but that's, that's a separate thing. But in terms of the financial aid fund, they can apply online, and the key thing is if they miss a deadline, they should go over to financial aid, because there's all this stuff online and it has to be processed and we have to be very robust about checking and so forth. A lot of it is government funding. But if they do hit a bump on the road, they should go to accommodation and welfare and they can apply afterwards. And that's, I suppose, the, the key thing from, from your end, because it's well advertised and so forth, and we have no shortage of, of applications. Last year, for the first time, it is also part-time. So up to last year, it was only full-time students who could apply. So full-time undergrad or postgrad. International students cannot. So that's, that's really important as well, and it's unfortunate that for them that they cannot avail of, of the financial aid fund. But I suppose the core thing that you need to know is it's there, all the relevant documentation is online, there are wonderful people who work there, and they will give you a bit more depth and flavour of what it's like uh, in terms of from the student perspective, and they can apply late if necessary. Obviously, we're not advertising that widely around the late part, but it's, it's really, really important. Now, money is important, but of course the other thing that's really important is to have a roof over your head. And it's hardly news to hear that Galway, um, you cannot miss it in the papers and so forth, but Galway and NUI Galway has the same challenges as everywhere else in the country. And we have the, the Accommodation and Welfare Office looks after that. So the people we're talking about, Teresa Kelly looks after the accommodation end, and Angela Walsh, you may know them. Una McDermott also works in that area. So they are the key people if you want to lift the phone. Teresa Kelly, Angela Walsh, Una McDermott. Um, whether it be accommodation or the, the welfare end. In terms of accommodation, what the Accommodation Welfare Office looks after is mainly the private sector. So you're probably well aware that Cara Village um, is there and there's 460 beds or whatever. This year there were an additional 429 beds opened in Goldcrest. So that's all under our control. Um, within Goldcrest, for example, there are a small number of places set aside, for example, for students with a disability. There are a certain amounts set aside for students from an international background and so forth. But the majority of it is our first years. Then there are lots of other residences. You'll hear of Korch na and Dun na and all lots of other residences. We maintain a relationship so we, with them. So that's where accommodation and welfare really kicks in. So the on-campus stuff, Goldcrest and Cara Village is commercial and it's handled by Anne Duggan and the commercial services. Everything else is handled by accommodation and welfare. And the role of the people in that office is to try and help people, to support them to get accommodation. It's not to get accommodation for them, but they liaise with landlords, for example. So there are lots of landlords' events. They liaise with the big accommodation providers. Later today, for example, we'll be meeting with venture capitalists who are thinking of setting up things. Three quarters of them come and they have great ideas and nothing happens. But every now and then you'll have the likes of the Westwood and accommodation will come from that. So it is quite a challenge, but really I suppose the key thing is they can see all the accommodation that's available online. There's a system there. They have people that they can meet one to one. And I can say that, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, Teresa and Angela, as you may know, got the President's Award for Service Excellence and absolutely fully deserved two years ago because they really are compassionate. They really help and support the, the students to get that accommodation. So once you know it's there, you have the literature, 
you're aware. And all I want to say now is best of luck with the rest of the day. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Gronia, thank you very much for having this meeting again. It's great to see colleagues and to see all the people that we work together with. Because as John said, we're all doing it for the student. So I always imagine the student is the center of a wheel and all the services are the spokes and we're all helping. And then there's a big rim around and then we're dealing with each other. And it's lovely just to meet, meet the faces again. Uh, <clears throat> So the Student Health Unit provides a, a service, as you know, uh, to a medical service to the students in NUI Galway. Um, this is for the students that are registered, fully registered, that we provide that service. Um, wh uh, where are we? We are in ours in the We are beside the, uh, the union, student union, and we're just above the Bailey uh, Allen Hall. Um, <coughs> So what, how, what, what kind of a service do we apply for? We, we give an acute medical service to the students. We would see ourselves acting as the doctor for the students when they're away from home and they can't get to their own family doctor. We encourage students that have chronic illnesses and ongoing illnesses to continue to link up with their own GP when they go home at the weekend or during the holidays because uh, we try and provide just acute services, just that if they have tonsillitis, bad chest, any sort of, we have a huge number of people, as John said, suffering from anxiety and depression. And we're finding that an awful lot of our time now is going to these students. Since uh, the 1st of September to the 29th of November, we have had 8,411 students coming into the, into the student uh, health unit. And of those was 398 really psychiatric mental health students. And the mental health students take up a lot of time because if you, if you have a tonsillitis, you can see that person in, 50, in five to 10 minutes. Quickly look in, you say, yeah, you, can, you definitely have tonsillitis. If you have somebody that has anxiety or depression, it's going to take a long, long time to talk to them and to make sure that they're are not suicidal or you know to do they need to be referred on to the psychiatrist etc we have a psychiatry service but we only have one session a week and the psychiatrist comes in and does a four-hour session and uh, at the moment the next um, the next available appointment is the beginning of April for a new appointment and uh, she, uh, the psychiatrist would see a new a new person and would take an hour to see a new person and then a review she might she or he might see uh, four or five reviews and they take half an hour. So uh, th th that's something that we, we're looking at going forward to try and get more psychiatry. <coughs> um, <coughs> we also provide other clinics. We have an STI clinic which the Students' Union have very kindly supported and encouraged us and we got funding from the Project Fund to supply this and we have a, a STI clinics twice a week in the in the unit unit, um, they're by appointment only, and they are for people that may not have any symptoms, but they would like a checkup, or they might be going into a new relationship, or they just want to make sure they haven't got anything. Anybody that has uh, an emergency STI, we see them during the, the day. We also have uh, physiotherapy, and uh, you have to book that, and it costs uh, forty euros to the first time to see the physio, and then it costs thirty follow up. Um, mainly the health unit uh, the, uh, coming in to see the GP is free. There are, no, there are no charges. We charge sometimes for small things like uh, some, uh, if, we're, if, if we're checking somebody for the pill and things like that because it's not acute. acute. We have, uh, how do people get into us? They have to queue up every day at nine, uh, at the, we open the doors at 9.15 to 12.30 and from 2.30 th to 4.30 and you queue up and you first come first serve basis and uh, you get to see the you get to see the nurse who try to uh, adjust the patient and then the, if she feels that or that that patient needs to see the doctor they're put into the doctor. Um, we have an on-call at nighttime service and this is, is, uh, is uh, all the whole year and we use um, uh, doctors at night time but it costs the students a student rate to see the doctor after six. And we have city doc at the weekend. So the students are seen the whole year round if they have anything. 
Um, what else? Uh, that, uh, yeah. And uh, the, that's it. Uh, yes, Sorry. after Christmas, thank you, Geraldine. After Christmas, we're setting up new clinics. Uh, we're hoping to do a travel vaccine clinic and try and we're trying to make a little bit of money so that we can get psychiatry and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we're setting up a travel vaccine. So people, if they're going abroad during the summer, they might come in and we're going to, to make sure that people know that this is going to be. And thank you. Thanks. Thanks and we'd love to see any of your students. Um, hi, um, I'm Nori Manning, the mental health support worker, and I'm managed from the student health unit, but I take referrals from student health unit, counselling, um, chaplaincy, and the disability support service. Um, so this role is, I'm four years here in January, um, and there was someone before me previously. I suppose the role has developed as time has gone on, and it's led by the students, really, what their need is. So it's a person-centred service, so I suppose I work differently with every student, but there are certain things that come up, like anxiety, depression, um, you know, financial stuff where I would link in with um, Dave or with accommodation and welfare. Um, I would have very strong links with counselling, disability support service, so that's really key to it. So we all, if we're working with the same students, we just want to ensure that we're all not doing the same thing or that we're all going in the same direction. So sharing information when appropriate is really important as well. Um, so the students, the referral is done through an inter inter service referral form and it's signed by the student. It's the student's choice whether they come to me or not and I make sure that they're aware of that. And in general, once they come once, they will come back again. So I suppose I, every student is different and it's led by what the student's needs are. So when I'm explaining what I do with the student, I say that I work with students around anything that's affecting their mental health. So the aim of my role, I suppose, is to maintain their well-being and support them to be able to do this. Um, and I also run a programme called RAP, which is Wellness Recovery Action Planning, um, which is about students learning how to ensure that they know what triggers are, so it could be exam times or triggers, how they maintain their, their wellness every day, so what they need to do in a day when they come to college to stay well, because often they haven't realised that things have changed so much that people they had a lot more support when they're at home and then they're here on their own. Um, my role has... Uh, develop hugely that students are now kind of self-referring uh, back into me that were there maybe last year because it, um, to say that a student will be cured you know and that they'll move on isn't really what we're looking at when we're thinking about mental health because you continue to have mental health and life will throw something at students all the time so if uh, I'm actually based in Arson Evie which is the small little green building behind us here um, and I suppose the referrals do only come from those um, four sources but at the same time it's good to be aware that I'm here because students uh, com can come through those sources from other um, units and that so um, I'm trying to think is there anything else I've forgotten um, I suppose this I'm willing to work with a student on most things and um, within reason and the within reason is where it gets a bit uh, with students sometimes wondering is that my role but I think for a student they often just need someone as a support that and maybe they aren't aware what it is they're getting but it's someone that's there as a, a sounding board not counselling but maybe just to figure out problem solving to plan um, a timetable for life and to look at everything from sleep to what they're eating to their living arrangements so that's why having this link and, and knowing who everyone is and where students can go to is so important to my role. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning to everybody and uh, lovely to see all of you and thanks very much for being here. Gronya, thank you for facilitating this. My name is Ben Hughes and I'm working at the Chaplaincy Centre and the people that work with me, Jimmy McGovern is working with us as an intern, Dolores McAndrew, possibly known to many of you as administrator and um, the services that we provide, number one, a drop-in centre and um, that's over at the Distillery Road. Um, and uh, what we do there is meet with students uh, on a daily basis and again uh, they simply self-refer or are referred from many of your offices to deal with a range of issues so they can actually be academic they can be personal issues around their own mental health or anxiety they can be around family concerns financial issues so it's a broad range of issues that are presented in the chaplaincy so we support students in so far as we can there, or we're also actually a referral agency to other professionals, either internally or externally. And then we continue that support to ensure that the student continues to progress academically and personally. 
Uh, in addition to that, then, we advocate for students. So if necessary, we'll contact particularly academics and alert them to the student situation. It's simply information so that the academics will know the context of a student's life. So if a student continually isn't presenting, um, it may be really important that the, their, their course director or their lecturer knows the context of that student's life. And then, actually, that may be a pathway for the student to engage directly with the, uh, the, the, their, their academics. In addition to that, then, um, we're one service that uh, continues to engage with parents. So parents will uh, continually engage with us, call, talk about a situation again that we may need to know about their child or the context of their life or something that may be ongoing or something occasionally that emerges. So it could be family illness, it could be bereavement, um, could be hospitalisation, any of those broad issues. And then we will, uh, with the other services, uh, determine how that actual information is disseminated through the university. Uh, there are two uh, particular protocols that we uh, look after. Number one is student death protocol. So in fact, when you um, see a student death uh, notification being issued, all of the work that has happened in order to uh, uh, um, put that together has actually come from the chaplaincy office. So once we hear, and we really depend on people like yourselves, because we don't automatically hear. So if in an instance you ever hear of a student death or even are concerned, simply ring through. We'd really value that, and then we can actually expo explore what we need to do. So immediately we hear, we begin to actually mine through the information, call a protocol meeting that includes uh, other professions on campus and management, and then begin to see how in fact we should deal with this appropriately. The other big protocol we deal with is the missing student protocol. Seldom does it happen, but again, oftentimes this comes true from either uh, landladies or landlords uh, or students. There's a student that hasn't turned up consistently um, and then we have to see, look, I I is it a missing student protocol or have they just gone home without telling uh, somebody else? But again, what we do is just very discreetly begin to kind of explore uh, the context of that situation and where necessary then begin to work with agencies like the Gardaí, management here, parents and local communities. One other piece that's very particular at the moment is the exam support. So the uh, chaplaincy service employs um, usually a PhD or master's students to help provide uh, support at all the major exam venues on campus and off campus. And uh, what we do there is we work with the invigilators and where there's a student in need of any practical support, missing a calculator, needing a glass of water, pens, turn up at the wrong venue, we deal with that. If in fact then they're dealing with issues of panic or anxiety, we actually deal with that on site and then refer them or accompany them to um, other professions where that may be <coughs> necessary. One big program that uh, has happened over the last number of years, you have the, the little brochure there in your um, chairs, it's the Chasseuse program. And again, it's just a program promoting health, mental health and well-being. Uh, students typically in semester one and two uh, will actually join us for two hour training programs in October and February. And again, we work with internal and external agency. And uh, students love this because, in fact, they get accreditation for it, get their certificate. But in fact, they can often uh, actually present for this under the umbrella of training. But in fact, it actually helps their own personal issues um, that they may be dealing with as well. It's very successful and something, again, that many of you actually uh, can promote students to actually engage in. Where are we located? Many of you know the office over on Distillery Road, so that's the drop-in. Uh, the other place is the chaplaincy centre, actually the chapel building, which is next door to the psychology building. And within the chapel, chaplaincy centre, there's number one, the chapel. It's a lovely ecumenical space for people of all faiths or no faiths, drop-in, light a candle. Masses are uh, said there uh, throughout the week, but in particular anniversary masses or memorial masses for the C students. Family gather, families gather there um, and for uh, deceased members of staff. In addition to the chapel, there's a common room used by many staff for different small group functions 
and a study room. And again, both of those rooms are used by students for individual or group study. And particularly now when the library, which is full, um, but it's a nice quiet place for people to actually gather for, for group studies. And in addition to that, there's a free kitchen facility there throughout the entire year. Um, I think we're, we're available 24 seven. If there are emergencies, our, our um, phones are on. And again, I suppose the one big thing is that if you are concerned about any issue in relation to a student and you're not sure what to do, ring the chaplaincy and oftentimes after a conversation we'll work out together where best we can actually begin to deal with that issue. Um, that's more or less it, Jimmy. Is there anything else? That yeah, well just um, one thing even to echo what Ben said is just to... Uh, to encourage referrals to us, I mean, the reason we want to make ourselves as visible as possible. But if you are concerned about a student, um, do get in touch with us because we, we don't automatically hear about those situations. You might get an email from a student um, saying that they, they won't be attending college for the next month or so due to personal circumstances as vague as that. It's worth letting us know and we might just explore because that might be more serious. It's something we might be able to help in some way. So that's, that, that's as much as we can. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I'm uh, J -J 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 James McCormack. I'm um, uh, d delighted to have the opportunity to speak on behalf of Counselling Service. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was actually very moved listening to the other speakers from Student Health Unit, from uh, Noreen, uh, Ben, um, because um, uh, we, 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 we get to work with people in a very vulnerable place, not only in counselling, but all, all student services. But it's a very real place as well. Um, so that the, 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 the main activities of the student counselling service is one-to-one -one, uh, counselling. We see, uh, we see up, up to approximately 1,400 people, uh, st students this year. Uh, we do 350-minute th uh, counselling sessions every week. Uh, there's over 40 uh, s staff members, some, some only a couple of core staff, the rest are, are sessional workers. We also use in interns as well. Besides one-to-one uh, -one counselling, we also offer uh, several on online programmes um, and these are available for students um, on this campus, but of course more and more students are working uh, remotely or on placements and they can avail of those uh, online programmes too. So Silver Cloud primarily is concerned with uh, anxiety and depression and uh, Participate is a programme, uh, it's, 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 it's specifically designed for, for people that are suffering from uh, social anxiety. That was designed by Eamon, um, way, 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 one of our own counsellors here. Uh, both of those programmes, students can elect to engage just with the robot um, and the, the machine answering questions and so on, or they can elect to get uh, supported um, uh, um, assistance. They get maybe a couple of minutes feedback every week. People that engage uh, with um, the person with, with personal feedback from a trained counsellor or other staff member, um, their rates of improvement uh, are, are markedly um, improved. We also um, uh, provide uh, the, the Smart Study Smart Life programme, which is a series of once-off workshops and short courses. The short courses, courses will include mindfulness, um, uh, positive mindset and resilience, um, and just the, the, the efficacy of some, some of these programmes, it's been proven that, uh, J John was talking earlier about how sometimes when we're distressed or anxious, the brain goes offline. And so the amygdala or the reptile part of the brain, the primitive part of the brain concerned with survival takes over. Uh, pe people, they've done, we've done all, there's all kinds of interesting research with uh, brain scanning at the moment, but people that have done just uh, the eight week uh, mindfulness course, uh, two hours a week, uh, the brains, the, the amygdala, that part of the brain that's primarily concerned with taking over uh, when we're in moments of stress and anxiety has shrunk. Not only that, but a year later when they've done the same uh, scans uh, with people who have done that programme, <coughs> the amygdala has still shrunk, so it has a long-lasting effect. Um, the other role, very important role that we provide um, student counselling is we, we provide a, a pastoral care role for staff. So if you're working with a student, concerned about a student, uh, you're not sure how, how they are really, you can always give us a phone call and, and talk to us, particularly if you're concerned if the student is at risk. 
The other uh, program that we do, we're actually doing one tomorrow and one uh, on Thursday is the identifying, it's a, a, a day long training for staff called responding, um, identifying and responding to students um, in distress and at risk. So we, we take, uh, we, we just help support staff uh, to, you know, to effectively, to recognize the signs of distress, um, to work out whether it's uh, urgent or not urgent, and uh, particularly to define if, if, there's a, if the student might be at risk of suicide, and how to effectively respond in a way that's not going to uh, negatively impact on the staff member, because it's, it's quite distressing. I'm sure you've all, maybe a lot of you will have realized working with somebody who's distressed. Um, so we're, we're very busy, uh, increasingly so. I think um, t Tony Bates, uh, he just spun out and, and so on, they used to have t-shirts that said, please talk. Uh, recently at a conference he said, they're gonna get t-shirts that say, thank you for not talking. Because <laughs> there's just so many more people and we know from, we work in the interdisciplinary uh, with uh, student health units, disability, with uh, Nori, the mental health worker, with careers, with chaplaincy, accommodation and welfare, uh, Dave, uh, the financial aid um, fund as well. So, um, the t thank you. Uh, it's only it's really really important I have to say. So, <laughs> the the, the 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 main counselling services in it's in five distillery road near the the Isle of Irish Bank. We're open from from uh, drop ins from two to four. Uh, it's first up best dressed. So, if you ask students to come a little bit before two. They won't have to wait uh, for so long. Uh, we see the first eight to twelve students every day. Um, counseling sessions are offered between nine, between nine a.m. and nine p.m. Uh, Monday to Thursday, and then nine to five uh, Monday to Friday. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. Um, there's some handouts at the back. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, Dave is my name, um, and I'm financial counsellor on campus located in accommodation and welfare. I work on a Tuesday and a half day on a Wednesday every week. So if somebody would like to meet me after this session, if you know a student who would like to meet me, it's through Angela and Teresa really in accommodation and welfare. If the student just drops up there, they'll book a session with me. It's the easiest way to manage the diary. So I, wor I work with students. My background is that I'm a counsellor off campus. I do a lot of work in counselling off campus. I don't work as a counsellor on campus. Um, I have a financial background as well, so that's why I was asked to do the financial counselling role. So <laughs> I work with students a lot around budgeting and around managing their money and around daily uh, techniques and tools around that area. But more and more, I guess I found myself pulled into or working much, much more with the, in the financial aid fund. So before I go to the financial aid fund for a tick, um, when I meet a student, usually they present with a financial issue, but I'll meet them holistically. So I meet them around finance, I meet them around their personal um, situation, uh, their social, uh, any social issues they may have integrating into college. Students find it really difficult to integrate, a lot of them. Um, and I'll meet them around academics. So I don't know the answers to academic questions. I have ideas around the social side and the personal side, but I would plug into counselling, clubs and societies, academics, <coughs> accommodation, welfare, fees, noreen, and the, and, the, and, the, and the mental health side. Uh, so I do a lot of referring out of the financial meetings. So maybe just to talk about the finance, the financial aid fund then. Like there's about, John mentioned earlier, I think he said there was about 800,000 in the financial aid fund every year, around that figure. And he mentioned the point system as to how it's allocated. So the, the, just to give a little bit of detail around that, it, there's just two areas. One is income. So students are allocated income depending on their parents, are allocated points depending on their parents' income and their own income. So that's very clear. Um, and that can, they bring in documentation to show what those figures are. Um, they're then, the other major side of it is that they're allocated points depending on their personal circumstances. And that's not so clear, really. Um, and it's very broad. Um, and the types of issues that come up when I meet students, I guess, and it's a challenge for students, really. One is that they feel very stressed and anxious. And as James said, that means that their reptilian brain is activated and their frontal cortex is 
really closed down a lot of the time. So they find it very hard to think through their situation. So they, might, they may find it difficult to apply for the financial aid fund. They may, they may be overwhelmed by it, even though it's, not, you know, it, it, it's relatively OK. Uh, the system is pretty clear. But I find many students get overwhelmed because they're overwhelmed with their situation. So I'm very keen to meet those students, as is the accommodation and welfare team, and we'll sit down and do the application with them. Um, because they just find it really difficult. Um, so under their personal circumstances, the type of issues that come up are really tough situations where maybe their parents are bankrupt and they're facing repossession of their home. Their parents may be on very low income. Um, may have, their parents may have health issues and the students are going home at weekends to look after their parents. That happens quite a lot. The students themselves may have health issues, whether it's physical or emotional, where they can't work part-time. So it's their, obviously their income is very low then. Um, their parents may be deceased, so there's very little income at home. They may be estranged completely from their parents, so they have no contact or support at home. So it's that broad, and every student then within that is, is unique, really. No two students are the same. Um, so having met them well first of all they can write that in the application form but in fairness many students who are in the worst situations find it really difficult to talk about it so when i meet them i'll explore that very sensitively with them so that we can allocate as many points to them as we can to reflect their situation so that between their the income details and their personal circumstance details they can get the maximum support from the fund and finance doesn't always fix the issue, but it certainly helps. Uh, that is, uh, it helps a lot. So finally, then this is uh, John mentioned this, but I'll mention it again. Um, late applications. First, well, first of all, students. Many, 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 many students don't know about the financial aid fund at all, even though it's widely um, advertised, and they become overwhelmed by all the information they get when they come on campus. And I'm sure you all have the same experience around that. So I'd be encouraging you really to talk about it. If someone is in a, is in a personal, very personally challenging situation, um, I'd really like to meet them because a lot of the time finance can be an issue underneath that. Um, and I guess on the late application side, um, while we don't want to have hundreds and hundreds of late applications, we're doing a lot of late applications and we really want to do them. So <coughs> students will come to me and they'll say, but the, the fund is closed, the deadline is passed. It's not passed. If, they're in, if, they're, if it's a serious situation, it's always open, really. We'll always find a way. So um, I'm, I'm located in accommodation and welfare and I'd love, I'd love to plug in with you if you want to at any can, time. Can you just say who is open for the, who can apply, just so it's clear what students Okay, sure. Um, car time and, and full time international students can't apply. Uh, John mentioned that that wasn't the case in previous years. Maybe just to give a bit of clarity around that, the reason for that is that the funds are coming from the EU, and the EU <coughs> specified that that it has to be used for EU students. Is it just undergrad? No, it's undergrad, undergrad and postgrad. No, I mean undergrad, postgrad, part time and full time. It's all students really except the international side uh, and some Erasmus students. That can be a tricky enough area. Good morning all. I'm just going to be very brief. Um, my name is Shauna Prenga, as Grania said, from the Student Information Desk. And the Student Information Desk is the one-stop shop service, kind of a, a help desk service, if you like, for students who are looking for access to kind of first-level queries based on registration, exams, uh, admissions, and conferring. And kind of like we would deal an awful lot with students who are coming in, you know, with looking for replacement ID cards if they've lost their ID cards. If a student is looking to exit out of the university and they want some assistance with that. And we've developed a, an improved collaboration with the colleges and the schools this year with regards to course withdrawal, which is we've seen great benefits not only for the students but also for our colleagues who we work with across the board. Um, we deal with stamping of forms for students who are probably you know medical cards child benefit whatnot 
Uh, we do with an awful lot of statements if students are going abroad and they're looking for graduation statements for jobs maybe in the UAE or in North America or the USA. Um, we also do graduate academic verification for our graduates and that's really increased in the last two years because there's a huge number of our graduates obviously as we all know going abroad and they're working abroad. Um, we do transcript requests, uh, exam transcript requests, reprints. Um, that again is another service that has surged in the last three years going down to again our graduates going abroad and also for students who are applying for say maybe postgraduate courses within are also in different universities across the country. Uh, the student information desk would have a very close relationship with an awful lot of the student services, uh, with the colleges, with the schools, with, di with different cases mm -hmm. with regards to students and kind of going to the points that were earlier that were made earlier by James and by Chris in regards to students in distress. Sometimes we become that kind of signpost, we're kind of a signposter for students who come to us when they're in a situation of distress. And you know, it's not easy when you encounter a young person who is in that situation and they're kind of feeling helpless and all you want to do is give them those stepping stones to get into somebody, to see somebody and try and get some help ultimately. Uh, only recently in the past week we've met a, couple, a good number of students, especially around, around exam time, when students are obviously very stressed out, they're reaching out to the different services, it could be a number of issues, it could be a death in the family, it could have been someone who's been assaulted, it could be any type of level of, of issue that sometimes those students can have a very, very difficult time on how to deal with and just getting them into the services and getting them talking to somebody to try and help them and maybe work their way through and just not to have that pressure on them because you know exam times is a very, very pressurised time. So we would deal with, with regards exam timetable issues, late entry seating, as going back again to the, the students who mightn't get a complete timetable as a result of some certain issues with regards to registration and whatnot. And that's one of our, our favourite things this time of the year when there's late registration or modules and whatnot, and Breach would know about that. Um, so, but we all work together very collaboratively to try and make it easier for the student. And when it comes to the fact when they have an exam timetable that's missing, they will get a late entry seating. So that's kind of puts that fear to the side. Where we are, as you can see, we're in RSC Cahill. We're on the, on the ground floor. <coughs> we're contactable predominantly by email, trying to increase the whole online service because we're actually able to turn around a lot quicker with regards to requests that are coming in, into us online. Uh, it's obviously the most popular way to deal with, <coughs> with, with, with customers these days, and the students are our customers, the graduates are our customers, and we have to take care of them like that. Um, so obviously we have a drop in our opening hours as you can see on the board. I also have some leaflets down below just listing as to the type of services we do. And also we are the lost and found depot. But that's not for humans. We don't pick them up and put them in there. But the lost and found was something that was once upon a time in a little book and now it's an online form. People can log their form like any type of lost and found service. Uh, and we try our best to return the property back to the human being. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you, Gronia. Good morning, everybody. Um, now, it is two for the price of one, and I'm conscious of time, so we won't um, hold you too long. But I guess what I'll do is I'll talk about disability support, and then Jane will talk about the academic skills side of things. Um, three things I'm going to cover very briefly. First is who can come and access support from us? Then if they do, what can they expect? What support is there for them? And thirdly, how can they access support? So I'm going to keep it quite brief and um, give that overview. So basically, any student who has a disability, a long-term or an ongoing physical or mental health condition, or specific learning difficulty. So they're the three groups. Often I think people might think of the obvious disabilities when they think of students who might access our support. They might be <coughs> thinking about physical disabilities or sensory type disabilities, but in fact, it's far broader than that. Um, we have students with a mental health diagnosis. We have students with significant ongoing illnesses, um, students on the autism spectrum, and so it goes on. Um, we have about over, just in recent times, over 1,000 students registered with us, and that's been a 44% increase over the past four years. So it's fantastic that students are coming to university and actually accessing that support. 
So it's good to be to keep that in mind in terms of who can access our support, particularly if you're coming across students, <coughs> excuse me, who are struggling or who might appear to be struggling. Feel free to get them to make in contact with us if they have a disability or an ongoing health condition, or if you want advice as a staff member and you're not sure, please call us and, and we'll talk through that with you. That with you. So if students do make contact or when they do register, so what do we do? Basically our role is to look at what impact that disability or health condition or specific learning difficulty is having on their studies. And in doing that, a disability advisor will meet with the student, undertake a needs assessment and will be talking to the student about the impact of that condition. From there we can work out what supports or what reasonable accommodations they might need in class, for exams or if they're going out on placement, they're the three areas we look at with each student individually and from there we put supports and accommodations in place. And we liaise with the academics and other university staff um, to make sure that those supports can be put in place so that the students are now on a level playing field like every other student and can get their head down and get on with their studies. So how do students register with us? It's a three-step process. We have an online registration form, so students can um, register with us online. They need to produce evidence of their disability or their health condition or their specific learning difficulty, and then they come for a needs assessment with one of the disability advisors. So it's a three-step process. If there's any questions about that, they can make contact with us. It's a free service. It's a confidential service. And I guess for us, the main aim is to make sure that students have the supports in place that they need to get on with studying like every other student. So um, I'm going to pass now to Jane, who will talk about the academic skills side of things. But as I said, if there's any concerns or questions, feel free to make contact with us. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about the online academic skills hub, and it's, a, it's an initiative that's linked to um, the library's face-to-face -face academic skills hub desk uh, just inside the doors here, if people are aware of that. Um, so I suppose, yeah, as Bernie has said, our numbers in the Disability Support Service have grown hugely over the last number of years, and um, that's the number of students, not unfortunately the number of staff. <laughs> so I suppose um, we are really trying to focus on fostering independence and independent strategies. You know, obviously we do put supports and accommodations in place, but we really encourage our students to um, solve their own difficulties in some way. So whereas in the past we might have um, provided a lot of one-to-one -one learning support, uh, now we're moving towards uh, mainstream support, supports that are available to all students and that's very much in line with national policy the national access plan uh, really emphasizes that students with disabilities should you know as far as possible make use of the mainstream uh, resources available to all students so we got some funding from the students project fund um, back in 2016 uh, to develop an online resource um, just with some very kind of simple short snappy um, resources um, you know, around academic skills. Uh, the, the, the kind of academic skills that can trip students up, I suppose, things like communication, presentation, organization, uh, reading, research, critical thinking, assignments, exams, and so on. So I definitely <coughs> encourage people to have a look at that resource. It's available online. Um, there's flyers there at the back of the room if you want to take a few. And if you do come across students who are struggling with even a simple task like emailing a lecturer, there are nice little resources there that can just give them some tips and checklists and uh, hints and guides to, to get to send them on their way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the Academic Skills Hub, the online version. And I think Chris now from yeah. the library is yeah, going to talk about the face-to-face the -face support that's available in the library. Uh, hi there, everybody. I'm uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'm Chris Bean. I'm uh, from the library. I'm uh, uh, from the marketing engagement as well as the academic skills uh, teams at the library. So, uh, uh, so as you probably know, uh, the library is just across the foyer. Um, that's where we're located, and we have another uh, a number of uh, different service points uh, that I'll run through uh, in just a second. But um, uh, in general, so the library uh, can be a, a barrier to things like academic success. Uh, transition, retention, uh, good mental health even. Uh, so students are expected to work with uh, new kinds of information here at the university. So uh, a scholarly information, they're expected to engage with that. Uh, use information in new ways, so thinking critically and analytically about it, uh, as well as citing and referencing it so as to avoid uh, plagiarizing it. Uh, and uh, they're doing this in a very complex digital environment, although we're always uh, uh, working to make our digital uh, 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 resources uh, as user-friendly as possible. Uh, so these are real hurdles, and uh, we can help to overcome them and uh, make sure that they're uh, confident and, uh, and achieving academic success. 
uh, and uh, and the the information skills that we develop are, are ones that I think they can take with them uh, after they're done university to their own uh, uh, individual lives and uh, and into their workplaces and careers. So. Um, uh, so just uh, so again, we've got a, a number of service points across the uh, the organization. So uh, on the one hand, we have the library and IT uh, service desk. So that's right straight into the library, uh, straight through electronic gates when you when you're pointing straight ahead there. Uh, another frontline service for both um, for students for both ISS and the library. So they can go there for help with um, uh, campus IT services or or or, or their uh, or their library accounts, taking out books, fines, this kind of thing. Uh, so uh, they can drop in there. We have a front uh, desk at the front. Uh, uh, they operate 8.30 in the morning uh, to 9.45 p.m. on weekdays and then 9.30 to 2.30 on Saturdays. Um, or uh, uh, anyone, a student, uh, uh, can put in a, uh, can email us at library at nuigalway.ie uh, uh, or they can put in a ticket at uh, service desk at uh, nuigalway.ie. Uh, next, uh, also in the foyer, if you just, uh, rather than uh, point straight ahead, you just sort of uh, turn your head a little bit to the left, uh, we have our Academic Skills Hub. Uh, so um, that is uh, very much tied to our, uh, our training calendar, so these are our number of academic skills workshops. Uh, it's there to, uh, to support the kinds of things that are in there, in particular the uh, smart searching for your assignment, uh, sort of foundational. Uh, workshop that we have there, so uh, so students can that go there for uh, uh, help finding information to uh, uh, to be successful with their assignments, um, and that is uh, open Monday to Friday, uh, ten to twelve and uh, two to four, uh, so they can drop in there uh, and meet with one of our skills assistants there, um, or they can email at academic skills at nuigalway.ie. Um, our building itself has quite a few uh, uh, self-service supports that students uh, uh, can use and do use uh, quite a lot. So we've got uh, group study rooms, uh, printing, we've got a maker space with uh, 3D printers in it, um, uh, self-check machines, uh, open stacks of hold rooms, all that kind of stuff. So uh, just, uh, just remembering that the building itself is open a little bit longer than our, our actual service hours, so it's 8.30 to 10 on weekdays. 8.30 to 5.30 on Saturdays and 10 to 5.30 on Sundays. And uh, finally, we have a wealth of online resources, um, particularly in the form of our library guides tutorial. So if you or, or, or a student can, can Google this, if you just Google NUI Galway library, uh, library guides, uh, and they'll see them. So on the one hand, we've got subject specific guides with key resources for uh, all of the various disciplines around campus. I've got generic skills guides for skills like uh, academic integrity, so that's your citation referencing, avoiding plagiarism. Uh, digital skills, so we've gotten into some really exciting stuff, including uh, uh, podcasting, uh, uh, making digital videos, this kind of thing. Uh, so we've got guides there to help people if they can't come to one of our workshops, uh, and academic writing. So, uh, so of course, the, 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 those being online, they're available 24 hours a day. Uh, so uh, uh, that's that's it for me. Thanks very much. It's crisis. Are some of those open to staff as well? Uh, so some of them. I know this is for students, but just sometimes it might help if staff attend. Them. Yeah, yeah. We're pretty. We, we, we don't. We won't turn anyone away. Uh, you know, uh, uh, anyone who comes to one of our workshops is uh, absolutely welcome. So uh, so by all means. Yep. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks very much. Hi. How are you? Um, I'm Josephine Walsh. I'm head of the Career Development Centre. So just to introduce you to our services, Grania kindly gave us a kind of a template, that, so that's been very useful. So the Career Development Centre is made up of careers advisors, placement officers, information professionals, and, and our admin team. So we're spread across the campus now because the, we've grown in the last while, but the, the Career Development Centre itself is in the Art Science Building, kind of just at the back of the building as you go over the glass bridge to the IT building. If you've gone onto the bridge, you've gone too far, so just before you go over the bridge, that's where you'll find us. So we, um, uh, we placement officers also then in the business school, so we have two placement officers um, up in the business school. We have a number of placement officers in the IT building, and we have a couple of people kind of um, uh, who will be moving into more arts offices once we find them, but they will be more central and, and aligned with the schools that they, that they support. Um, so that's kind of where we're physically based. So what do we do? Well, we, every time I tell my, my story around what the Career Development Centre does, I think of three things. So, so the first thing we do is we, we, we help students get clarity around what they're 
next steps are. So uh, the mission statement of the Career Development Centre is to support students to make successful transitions towards fulfilling careers. Now, um, that trips off our tongue because we try and live that every single day. So really it's about transitioning to work and transitioning um, to maybe further study. So we help them get clarity around that. Now we do that through one-to-one -one appointments, we do it through our, our humongous amount of events that we run so people can explore sort of career areas that they might be thinking about. So we help students get clarity around their career direction. We also help them to connect and we help them to connect with employers. We help them to, we run uh, hundreds of employer events every semester. We've our big fair in October. We've another one coming up in the springtime. And then we run every couple of weeks, every two weeks in term, we have a job market as opposed to a fair with a smaller group of companies. And we provide employer and residence uh, opportunities where we have an employer in the center kind of for the day. They might run a workshop and they also maybe meet students. So we help students to connect with employers, but we also help students to connect with other services. So we work very, very closely with our colleagues in the other student services, in the chaplaincy and counselling. We regularly refer students between us because what we find is the presenting problem is, uh, I'm not really sure what to do with my course, actually turns out to be something else when you go a bit deeper. So the careers advisors the, the training for careers advisors in, includes counselling, so we, you know, we would be kind of tuned in to ask the right questions, I suppose. So we're often referring students to between services. And also we work very closely in the last couple of years with the Disability Support Service <coughs> in supporting students to, um, uh, who are going out on placement. So we've now introduced a placement preparation, if you like, for students on disability. And we've seen the numbers of students who are happy to disclose their disability to an employer. Uh, has increased and that obviously makes for a good placement for both the student and the employer because whatever accommodations they need are now being identified. Um, and placement, while I'm on that subject, is one that's been growing for us, that our business there, if you like, has been growing. So we're placing about 1,000 students this year versus about 300 four years ago. So we're now placing all, this, uh, all the undergraduate placements in the business school, engineering and IT, uh, arts programs, lots of them just starting, um, and law uh, just starting, and a placement officer in the OCAD. So that has really grown in the last while. Um, so that's the clarity around their, their uh, uh, career direction. Help them to connect, and we also help them to compete in the job market. So a big piece of what we do is CVs, interviews, we're like a CV interview machine there sometimes and, um, and we've, people drop in just for, you know, to get their CV reviewed for a part-time job. So we're not just looking at, and we're very conscious about part-time work and how that actually increases and contributes to employability and we, we actually promote a lot of part-time jobs. We're, we're trying to create a central hub, if you like, for advertising part-time jobs for students on campus. We have about 400 students actually working on campus. We've done that that kind of analysis and uh, so th and we're trying to kind of corral that a little bit so people can find those jobs more easily and that they're paid more clearly and all the rest so that's another day's work um, so in terms of uh, competing so we prepare students we we um, review their CVs and we do mock interviews as well so um, and we also have introduced an employability award in the last last year we piloted it and it's running this year and that's been really successful and that's an award like the Alive Award but it's more around employability and it, it acknowledges that part-time work that students do for students specifically who don't have a placement as part of their program that's some, kind of something that they can aim for um, so we have uh, how do we deliver all that we have one-to-one -one appointments we've about 4,000 one-to-one appointments in a year we run multitude of events workshops skills events employer events etc kind of how to find out more about a career in kind of events. Um, um, and we're open nine to five um, every day, 11 on a Friday, because we have a meeting to make it all happen. <laughs> and, uh, and also, I suppose, so what might you, why might you refer somebody to the Career Development Centre? So if you meet a student who's unsure of their course, maybe, or even modules, we get that a lot. You know, I don't know what module uh, to do. So if they're unsure of their course, if they're unsure where their course might take them, that can be very unsettling. And it's amazing. I have lost count of the number of students who, when they actually see something at the end of it, when they have a bit of clarity around what the possibilities might be, that really settles them into the course. You know, it's just about getting some information, really. So we work a lot with students like that. Um, 
We also, uh, if students are trying to figure out how do I make myself more marketable, more employable, we're happy to have conversations with students around that, signpost them around you know, the things that they could do to increase their employability. And the other thing you can do is encourage them to come to our events. Because it's amazing how many people we meet and, and we say, well, did you go to the event about careers in psychology? No, no, didn't know about that. So I would say, if we, you know, wherever you are, try and you know, access the event schedule for the Career Development Centre. It'll be out in January, it'll be online, it'll be all over the place, physical handouts and uh, copies of it. So please refer students to events as a first pass if, so, if somebody's in trouble. Just see what events we've on. That might actually, um, it'll connect them with us in the first place, but it'll also might actually solve whatever the problem might be. And um, I have left um, some flyers down below on, on booking appointments and how to see jobs and all the rest. That's through our system called Connect. So, um, you know, and you can, staff can go on to that as well and you'll see uh, you know, if you're interested, you'll see what events are coming up. You can sign up yourself. We're open to uh, staff coming to our events as well. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm Frank Glavin from Information Technology, and uh, I'm just going to talk to you a bit about the uh, Computer Programming Drop-In Support Centre. Uh, so this was set up back in 2010 by Professor Michael Madden. Um, I was involved at the time as a, a PhD student, um, and basically what the service entails is uh, computer programming tutors being available in uh, a room over in the IT building, room 205. Uh, so it's a drop-in service, so you don't need to make an appointment. And the kind of support we provide are just uh, describing programming concepts, uh, working through problems on the whiteboard. Um, the room itself is equipped with two whiteboards, um, two round tables, 10 PCs, um, and an overhead projector. Um, and there's always two tutors available at all times. So again, when students come along, they just have to they register for an account um, on the machine, and then they log in and out of the room, and that's just to keep um, statistics for ourselves for the usage of the center um, throughout the year. So the center itself is um, it's funded by HEA, uh, so again, we have to show that it's being used and we do get a lot of usage from the computer science um, degree in arts and IT, uh, some engineering students, uh, but we'd really like to get the word out further across campus because um, in a lot more de departments um, there's computer programming aspects of people's research and we don't only just target first years and undergraduate students, um, we also highly recommend masters and PhD students that have some form of computer programming um, to come along, get advice from the tutors, um, they can sit down and work away themselves and ask questions when they want. Um, but yeah, so basically we just want to, to spread the word. So the, the center itself is open five days a week during the academic year, so this will be the last week that we're open, so during study week for again, people that are preparing for uh, programming related exams. Um, we'll open up again in January, probably after the first week of teaching. Um, so what the service doesn't provide is uh, solutions to assignments, and we're, we're very strict about that. Um, we generally talk students through the problem either on with pen and paper or on the whiteboard. Um, and we're just basically helping them with their own self-directed learning. So the main thing is to try get students to take the first step to come in, meet the, the friendly tutors who will work with them one-on-one. -on -one. There'll always be tu two tutors available um, in the room. Uh, we can have roundtable discussions of team projects, help with final year projects. Um, the list goes on, really, so anything related to computer programming, we're happy to sit down with students, provide them with advice, um, and work through either their, their assignments are, are related projects and so on. So I left some um, posters down the back. I'd appreciate it if, if people could take them and spread them as far and wide around campus as possible because we want to get the word out. Uh, we're based in the IT building on the same floor as the coffee shop um, and the timetable, the tutors and their areas of expertise and so on are all available on the website. We also have Facebook and, and Twitter accounts um, and so on. So all of the information uh, is online, um, and thank you for your That's time. That's all right. Thanks very much, Frank. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Hello, everybody. 
Um, I also brought some brochures here in case everyone is interested. I leave them over there at the desk. So my name is Kirsten Pfeiffer. I'm a maths lecturer here at the School of Mathematics and I'm also the manager of our student maths and statistics support center. We call it SOMS for short. SOMS stands for support for undergraduate mathematics and statistics. Uh, SOMS is going to be 10 years old in February, so <laughs> we'll probably have to mark that day a bit. Uh, it's, it's, it has been going well so far. What are we? We are, first of all, a mathematics and statistics support center. It's uh, a free drop-in center. So students, our, our team consists of myself and uh, a large number of postgraduate students, mostly PhDs and several master's students. They come from a wide area, wide range of area of expertise. Some are doing their studies in statistics, others applied maths and others pure mathematics. Some have come through access foundation courses themselves, others did their degree through engineering, arts or science. So all together, I think we have quite a broad range of knowledge there to offer. Um, what support do we provide? Yeah, so most of all we provide free drop-in support for first and second year students five days per week over 10 or uh, 12 weeks during each semester. Um, we support, we provide additional support for any math subject so that's not just students who are doing science uh, studies, but many students here in NUIG are doing some sort of maths or statistics, be it through engineering or economics, commerce or arts students, and of course the science, physics students. So each year we have, I think, uh, several thousand students doing some sort of maths and statistics students and not everyone finds it easy so often they just need some support to get used from stu studying maths or statistics in schools getting used to quite different maybe expectations or experience or habits here which are expected from them here in, in university so we really focus on study habits and our philosophy is that we help students to help themselves. How does that work? Students come in in the afternoon and we encourage them to sit together. We have round tables. We really encourage them to work together and get started and work for themselves. A tutor then will come to the student, introduce him and her or herself and start just see what is the student studying on and uh, give some advice to get started, but then leaves the student maybe on his or her own or with others to work by herself for a while and then will always come back after a little while to see how she or she is getting on. Sometimes the student may need more support, others really just need the five minutes kickoff and they are fine. Some are really happy to work by themselves and just like the fact that there is some person at hand in case they get stuck or need help. Some students need really revision or help with very basic mathematics. We are talking about revising how to add fractions or basic mathematics from years ago. Others are very advanced and they just like to share their ideas and talk mathematics, which is fantastic, of course. So we <coughs> offer all of that and uh, it's usually there's a nice boss in the room. The room is available for students to study themselves all day. But the tutors are there every afternoon from two to five and then on Wednesday, so that's Monday to Friday, two to five, and on Wednesday from seven till nine. Friday afternoons are dedicated to access and foundation students. We have specially trained tutors there for them, but either uh, students, so if they come, they won't be thrown out, they are welcome to. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Where are we based? We are on the ground floor of our saloon. I have already said when we are available and uh, more information you can find on our website and that includes the updated current timetable where students see which tutor is uh, available at what time. 
sometimes they may find one tutor works really, really well for them, so we would encourage to come back when this tutor is there again. Yeah, so how to contact us per email or just drop in, there is no appointment needed, and the best way is just keep an eye on the website. Hi everyone, my name is Niall, and I am the program facilitator over in the hub, which is the student common room and kitchen in Oris Um I suppose my role there is essentially student welfare, looking after students, trying to make them feel comfortable and welcome. Uh, the hub is a room where students can come in, they can hang out, there's a kitchen, we provide free tea and biscuits, there is, we have board games, we play music. It's basically just a relaxed environment where students can come and take a break from their lectures. If they are feeling a bit unsure and just want to meet new people, it's a place they can come. Um, if they're in need of advice or support, they can come and talk to me. Um, so I kind of, part of my role is as almost a signposting service. So to signpost towards the services that you all provide and uh, to be there to talk to students in case, you know, that's all they need. Um, so I have found that there's a lot of students that really just want somebody to talk to, as simple as that. And by providing that, it eliminates sending them off to another service, which from feedback they've given me has been something that kind of puts them off if they try and approach somebody to talk to that they feel comfortable talking to and then that person refers them to somebody else, which um, I'm in a position where I'm able to sit down and take that time and talk to them and I have a, a distinct advantage in that. Um, but when it is something that you know is beyond my remit or something that is requires more specialised knowledge, I'm able to refer on to the different supports and services available. Um, overall, we're open from about 8.30 in the morning till 8 p.m. at night, Monday to Friday, and then from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. So during that time, there's a fully functioning kitchen. There's everything that students need, and some students take advantage of the service that's there because they don't have access to cooking facilities where they're staying, they might be living in hostels, or they're staying in digs where I've been told that some students aren't you know, allowed to cook certain things, or they're only allowed to cook at certain times of the day, or they're not allowed to have, say, meat in the house, or whatever it might be. So this has really been a huge uh, source of support for students to be able to come in there, and by this they've met new people, they meet new friends, they eat together as groups, and there's a real camaraderie that gets formed and it's been lovely to be able to see those kind of friendships blossom and solidify over the last couple of months. Um, also as part of the hub, we have the Hub Well Crew, which is the Wellness, Entertainment, Leisure and Lifestyle. So it's uh, students, a mixture of international students and students from Commerce who are there on a project and their role is to fill in at the desk and um, there to offer support and point uh, students towards the services. Um, to keep an eye on the kitchen, if students, you know, are, if there's anything that they want or is there anything they can help with, that they can come up and talk. Sometimes that's all it is, they just want to come up for a chat, they'll sit down and have a cup of tea and chat with whoever's on the desk. Um, it's really just about having a communal space for students. It's one of possibly the only one in the university where <coughs> students can just come and hang out without the need to, you know, buy a cup of coffee and sit in there or you know, be super quiet, whatever. It's just you come in, you relax, and as far as possible, it's student-led. Whatever I can do, I try and take as many ideas from students. I want them to engage with me, tell me what they want, and where possible, be able to provide that. Um, there's no alcohol, even though we're across the bar, there's no alcohol provided, so it's a space where students can come to avoid that as well. I've come across a lot of students that, that it's just not their thing, and they'd like to be able to socialize outside of a place where it's um, alcohol. Um, so far, it's been going really, really well. Um, it's become a real kind of a, like a, a student sitting room as such, which is really what I'd love it to be in the end, where students can walk in and they feel like it's you know, somewhere they belong. Um, that's it. It's, it's very much just a relaxed environment. Uh, everything's done very informally. So if there are students that you feel, you know, maybe just need a bit of a chat about uh, adjusting to college life and um, that they're you know find it hard to meet new people and um, I'm always happy to sit down and have a chat with them in private and just very informally 
and point out what options there are to them and in what way I can support them or indeed yourselves can support them. Um, That's great. Thanks for um, I don't have flyers. On our website, we have, um, we have all the information there. Um, we have posters up around where, of our kitchen and the timetables, but everything will be on our Facebook and Instagram and the other social media stuff. Right. Thanks Lovely. very much, Niall. Thank you. Um, the Academic Writing Centre, there's nobody here at the moment, but as everybody knows, the Academic Writing Centre is based in the library on the second floor and they provide help to students who have to write essays or assignments that they come in with a draft and they will review it and give them tips on ways they can improve the, their writing, etc. So I just want to thank everyone for coming and I've sent around the slides to you so you have the web addresses for the services. The slides are very basic information, so it's just to give you an overview and you can have a look on the website of the service. But I think the main thing is to promote some of the services for the students because they don't know about them all. Um, you know, there's just so many there and the key is, I know that I'm always saying this, but they're all free. And once they leave here, they start paying for everything. So it's to avail of the services that ha are available to them. It's really important. So thanks very much for coming and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.